hello everybody and welcome. Uh, if this is your first time on one of our Zoom events, a special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Devin Lau and I am the Assistant Director for Yale Center Beijing. Uh, Yale Center Beijing was established in 2014 as a gathering place for leaders from Yale, China, and the rest of the world uh, to dialogue about current events and pressing issues. We bring the best Yale professors to China to share from all fields of study, uh, including medicine, philosophy, music, economics, science, art, history, and today, uh, film studies. Uh, in the time of pandemic, even though we're not able to meet in person, we're very lucky to be able to have online platforms where we can reach uh, even more people than before and hear from a diverse field of experts. Uh, of course, we do hope to see you at the center itself, uh, Professor, as well as the rest of the audience, uh, once this all passes. But today we are especially lucky to have Professor Francesco Cassetti talk to us about a very appropriate and relevant topic, which is life on screens. And I say appropriate because of course today our meeting is very much facilitated by screens. Um, Professor Cassetti comes to this topic from a very prolific, illustrious, and wide-ranging academic career. Uh, that's brought him from his native home of Italy to Paris, to Iowa, to Berkeley, to Harvard, uh, among many other places. Uh, since 2010, he has been a professor of film and media studies at Yale. Uh, he sits on the board of many, many journals, museums, and societies, and is the author of six books, editor of over another 10 books, and has published countless essays. Uh, his interest in the subject of film and media studies ranges from genre to spectatorship to film theory to history to semiotics. Um, and once I knew that we would be stuck in quarantine for a while, I immediately reached out to Professor Cassetti because of his fascinating writing and theories on the role of screens in our lives and how we interact with it. Uh, this is evident in his latest book, uh, the Lumiere Galaxy, as well as some of his current research on cinema, fear, screens, and the overall mediascape. So especially relevant and exciting and interesting talk today, uh, and I'm very glad to be introducing to everybody uh, Professor Cassetti. Uh, please join me in welcoming him, and I also ask that if you are willing that you turn on your camera um, so that uh, professor can see you. It's always better to be able to actually see who you're talking to than to just talk to a screen, even though a uh, professor is a huge proponent of screens and a big fan, but, but I, I suspect he will enjoy seeing people if, if possible. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Devin, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, especially thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this uh, small event. I'm uh, very, very happy to deliver this uh, lecture, even though not in person, but in a virtual mode. So I want to start uh, this very brief uh, uh, set of consideration. I'm going to ask uh, five questions and to try to answer five answers. So let's start uh, from uh, let's say from the beginning, uh, which means uh, basically, let's say, uh, how do we meet today? So let's uh, answer with a mental experiment. Without the pandemic, uh, I could have done uh, several things. The first is to take a plane to take a flight and to move to Beijing, which actually is uh, what I wanted to do. And uh, maybe also in uh, time of pandemic, uh, there is air uh, uh, traffic still, even though you can see in the comparison of these two maps, uh, is not as strong as before. But uh, I could have done other things. For example, I could have take, a, I mean, come to see, uh, let's say, old dream to take a, tar a cargo and to cross oceans uh, with a cargo. You can see here the usual routes for shipping uh, stuff. 
And here is uh, a wonderful map with the ship that currently today are on the sea. I could have also do some other things, uh, send uh, um, a mail with my lecture, maybe a, a, a video cassette or a DVD or whatever you want through a FedEx. And uh, no, what we do is another thing, is use another infrastructure use the internet traffic and uh, likely i join you through a submarine cable providing the uh, broadband for my face my eyes my mouth arriving to you as an image uh, what is the small lesson from this first uh, issue? The very problem is that the internet traffic, as you have seen in the other maps, is the reason why I show you the maps, follows the same routes as other types of traffic by, by different means. It is what we can say an alternative infrastructure. We are very used now to have alternative choices for our personal infrastructure. We can shake the hands, we can say hello from the distance, but nevertheless we establish a connection. There is an infrastructure made by gesture. I can call somebody instead of, call, instead of meeting him by phone. I can use a Zoom or Skype. I can send a mail. I can ask somebody to say somebody else something, which is a human infrastructure that has been used for thousands and thousands of years. If we are now on Zoom, is a choice between different kind of infrastructure of communication. There are other infrastructure, not only communication, is transportation of goods. There is other infrastructure, political infrastructure, economic infrastructure, surveillance infrastructure. There is all this infrastructure. We are looking at the infrastructure of transportation of this immaterial uh, 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 good which is communication. And there are alternatives. And we choose an alternative now, not being able to be in person, I'm able to reach you through another infrastructure. So the first small lesson we learn is that our infrastructure are interchangeable. And life on, screen, on screens goes because life goes on screen because this infrastructure inter which are interchangeable. Second uh, uh, question, small question. Where do we meet today? Unfortunately, I do not know we are physically you are. I'm in New Heaven, in my house, in uh, my studio. Maybe you can see on the background uh, uh, some paint, some uh, drawings and, and uh, etchings that I collected uh, and I brought from Italy. I do not know where you are in Beijing, outside Beijing, in China, not in China, I do not know. But uh, we are not for sure in the place we were expected to be in normal times, not during the pandemic which is we are not, unfortunately, in Beijing, Yale Center. Nevertheless, the Yale Center in Beijing is still here, in a certain sense, because if I read on my screen <clears throat> the number of uh, people attending 
this event, which is a quite a relevant number. And I'm very grateful to, to you all to be here. There is, the first I read is Yale Center Beijing staff IT. And there are a couple of people that I thank that are hosting this uh, meeting and are also mastering this meeting. So in a certain sense, uh, the, what the French call mise-en-scene, uh, what the, what the uh, Hollywood calls director or filmmaker, the great magician that keep in his hands all what happens is ideally in the Yale Center Beijing. But we are not there. I'm not. Devin is not there. Nobody is there. We are somewhere else. We are in another situation. What is a situation? Irving Goffman defined the situation as any physical area anywhere. You can read on the screen what uh, is the definition of uh, of of. Uh, uh, um, uh, situation. Sorry, I'm working because I have my notes on one side and another computer on the other. It's, it's, it's a complicated situation. But it's a physical space and it's also a time in which we meet and meet means to have in, to be in close proximity with somebody else. Indeed, we are somewhere else, which is not a physical situation, which is uh, what uh, we'll see in a second, is called a synthetic situation. The screen becomes the space in which we become perceptible to the others. Is the reason why Devin asked you to turn on your computer? I can see you now and you can see me, it's a mutual seeing and where we uh, perform our mutual actions. The screen is not only a surface, is a milieu, is a space in which we gather, is the space in which we can have a situation according to Goffman. This is the second answer, the second little lesson we can, we can, we can learn from our, sit our situation, the situation in, we, in which we are. The screen is not only a surface, it's a space. It's something that I'm expected to manage, you are expected to manage, you are expected to raise hands in the screen, you are expected to perform as I'm expected to perform. Third question no longer in the usual place yet. This is yet is, is very important because of course the screen is not the Yale Center of Beijing. There are two different spaces. There are two different spaces, nevertheless, this difference is serious. We have to take an exam and to have uh, to understand what happens in this difference. I make three examples beyond the one we are living now. One is the telemedicine. During this pandemic, it did happen to me and I think to many of you to need a doctor and the visit in the office of the doctor, for some reason, was not possible. And nevertheless, the doctor was doing his job, or her job is because in this image there is a man. My doctor is a female doctor. And through uh, telemedicine and uh, an application that Yale uses, which is my, my chart, uh, which is one of the many applications possible of telemedicine, performed a perfect visit to me, a very examination, a very squared uh, 
a medical examination. The second example, virtual tours. You cannot go in this moment to the Sistine Chapel, but you can go. If you go on online and you ask virtual tours, uh, Sistine Chapel, you can have a perfect vision of Sistine Chapel. I don't know if you ever experienced uh, uh, the, 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 the Sistine Chapel, which is fantastic, it's a great visit. I had a privilege many years ago because an acquaintance in the Vatican to visit the chapel at six in the morning and I was alone. It was a mystical experience. And I can react or reenact this experience now visiting all alone, but virtually. The third example that I make uh, is the telework. I'm working from home now, and I'm not working less, I'm working harder. Students are flooding me with messages. We have long conversation with friends and colleagues all over the world. But I do not move to my office as usual. What happens? In each example I made, there is a transfer. The transfer is based on the idea that the two experience, I, uh, the two situation, I, I, I showed the live situation and the online situation are equivalent. Are they equivalent? My answer is very clear on this point. When we move, as we do now, online, on the screen, I can, I'm able, more or less, to provide the same knowledge. We are not living the same experience as being in the Beijing center. There is an equivalence of knowledge, but not an equivalence of experience. This is the reason why when uh, travel van were, will be lifted by different nations, people are going again on the Sistine Chapel. People are going again to the doctor. People are going again to meet each other for, 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 uh, for work. Because there is an experience inside. Not by chance, there is a difference today between the so-called, uh, uh, um, um, let's say, market or economy of knowledge and the economy of experience. One thing is to buy knowledge, another thing is to buy experience. And sometimes we need much experience. We need to go to Rome physically. I need to go once in Beijing, not only to visit virtually Beijing. Nevertheless, and this is my, and we are going to our third conclusion, the equivalence of transmitted and shared knowledge allows original situation to migrate in a new context. You are attending this lecture not, uh, and I, I, um, I do not know if I'm able to do that, but uh, because we think, we hope all that uh, my lecture can provide knowledge, not experience, of meeting, but knowledge that we can acquire while meeting. So the migration, because the equivalence of the knowledge, even though there is not an equivalence on experience. This is my conclusion. The media can relocate situations 
from one to another point when the knowledge is the quantity and quality of knowledge is respected. Fourth question. It looks familiar. In a certain sense, I'm doing a lecture as I'm used to do a lecture in a physical space. There is a familiarity between the traditional situations and the online situation, the on-screen situation. They look familiar. Familiar. And I grasp this familiarity. This familiarity is what allows now a lot of migration of, exp of, 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 of let's say, a, a situation from one point to another. I, I studied, uh, Devin mentioned my last book, uh, Lumiere Galaxy, which was a happy book and uh, is, has been translated in Chinese and, and I, I'm expecting to be published and I'm very proud about that in, I, I guess, in uh, one year. In uh, <coughs> the Lumiere Gla Galaxy, I studied uh, the way in which the film attendance in the film theater is relocated in different situations, in my house, in public, uh, on the public squares, on my computer, on my tablet, etc., etc. Take uh, two of this uh, migration, of this relocation from the film theater to my ha house and from the, from the film theater to a tablet. This is my point. To preserve the sense of experience and not only the sense of knowledge, the non-theatrical attendance must be improved. You cannot watch a movie at home simply and quietly and say, oh, it's the same experience than in the movie theater. You need to do something. For example, you have to arrange your living room or your small room, doesn't matter, in a way that there is a memory of the setting of the uh, film theater. This is the reason why many people, while watching a, a, a movie at home, they try to imitate the setting of the film theater. They put the chair in, in a row, they dim the lights, they be attentive, they focus, etc. But also, they just improve the setting. This is not the usual living room. There is a special setting for watching movies. And for, for example, uh, the, the, the tablets, you do not watch movies in an old tablet tablet. You watch the movies in the new tablets, tablets which have uh, systems like retina that are movie equal. They provide the same quality of the movie attendance. So there is an improving, and I mentioned uh, especially the improving in at home, which is a wonderful chapter. My book was, was started, uh, I, I tell this episode at the very beginning of the book. My, the first idea of my book, uh, or the, when I, uh, I decided to write the book, was I was, as usual, I was watching a movie on, uh, uh, in my house with my wife and I was chatting with her. And she said, shut up, we are watching a movie. We have not to speak when we are watching a movie. And they say, no, or, or uh, uh, say my, my wife, no, we are at home. She say, no, we are no longer at home. So I wrote the book to answer my wife. Yes, 
we try to model the experience to reshape the experience at home as if we were at the movies. We improve that. A theatrical-like setting, a more intimate space, a better quality image, a more appropriate spectator uh, behavior, don't speak, don't chat, a more focused look. Quite often, I have friends that also provide popcorn in order to look like they were watching a movie at home. I call that strategies of repair. In a relocated situation, we perform these strategies to repair the situation in order to restore the original situation. My last point, there are changes. Of course, there are changes. And also these changes are very interesting and very important. Let's go back to us. And ideally, in a sort of mental exercise, think about whether this or what if uh, this, this lecture could add a place in, in the real space of uh, Yale Center in Beijing. And now we are on Zoom. And make a little bit analysis of uh, the compare with different form of gathering. And I start with this uh, real situation of gathering. We have a party, you can see here. We have a party. We have uh, a conversation, an informal conversation. We have, uh, we have a very relaxed meeting and uh, you have uh, here um, a dinner or a lunch, it's a lunch, a work lunch, more, which is informal, but not that informal. What is the difference between these four situations? Despite their common informality, there are relevant differences in, in the four situations. There are different degree of focalization and functionality. Let's see. Here in the party, there is no focalization. It happens what happens. You meet what you meet. You go from one point to another is a completely spread and scattered situation. This is much more functional, the second. But we can imagine that uh, a cat is arriving and disturbing our conversation, or a baby is arriving and asking the mom, please take care of me. There is more focus, but an opening to the life that may disrupt at any moment this uh, situation. Here in the meeting is more difficult to have a disruption, but nevertheless, you are in a situation in which you can have other elements ent entering in, into the play. Somebody knocking the door, etc., etc., etc. This situation, being informal, nevertheless, is much more protected. Is a system organized around, is an, is, is, is an ambient, is, is a milieu in order to protect our meeting. Let's go to this point, which is the last point I'm touching. There are two different milieus enveloping the social encounter I discussed. One is a total open context. We call that environment. And this is a much more protected encounter. It's much more focused encounter. 
you have no element of this or smallest element of disturbance. And we can call it envelope. I'm following the opposition between environment and envelope. I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing this opposition from a philosopher who teaches uh, Floridi, Luciano Floridi, who teaches in Oxford. And this is a very smart opposition. And he make an example, which is uh, absolutely, I mean, I, I love that. You think the environment is your kitchen, your sink, everything is put somewhere. And an envelope, an envelope is your uh, washing machine, is uh, your, your uh, uh, where you, I mean, where everything is organized around an action to wash your 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 uh, your your silverware etc etc and he makes another example which is a very good think uh, uh, about uh, uh, for example uh, the uh, the self driven uh, cars they can, they can, you can, you can, you can use that on, on, on the usual roads. But you need, in order to perform better, roads organized around the behavior of these cars. You have to abolish, for example, a number of signals that are important for the driver and for his or her eyes, and give another kind of signal that is dialoguing directly with the car. You have to create an envelope. The envelope is an environment that is thought as structurally helpful for an action, for a performance. I do not know if I'm clear. You can ask uh, later if you want. My point is, that the screen is an envelope, is a milieu, Zoom is organized in order to optimize our relations, to minimize destruction, to minimize contingency, is something which is functional, is a space completely dedicated and organized for this kind of action. In a relocate situation, we perform what we call, what I call strategies of adaptation. We adapt our environment and we transform it into an envelope. This is a long discourse. I do not do that. I can come back in, in, in QA. But uh, uh, what anthropologists call the niche construction follows exactly that. Human from the beginning, they get into an environment and they transform that in an envelope. Starting from home, the invention of house and home was exactly that. Not only a shelter, but an envelope. And for, of course, Big factories are another kind of envelope, etc., etc., etc. So I move to my conclusion. While moving our life on the screen, we make five things. We choose an alternative infrastructure. We create a milieu on the screen surface around the screen. We relocate form. We relocate forms of encounter. We activate strategies of reparation and we create an envelope for a better performance. Of course, my final is a counter, uh, uh, in a, in a, it's a counter movement. Yet I desire, I would desire to go back on live and meet you in Beijing. Thank you so much. Now, Devin, I think we have questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation.
uh, a lot of things that help us um, put into words, I think, what a lot of us have been thinking about and experiencing ourselves. Uh, so we're going to move into a time of uh, question and answer. If you have a question uh, from the audience, please, uh, under the participants section, there is the option to raise your hand. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will try to call on you so that you can ask your question to the professor in person. Uh, the other option is to write your uh, question directly into the chat function. So in the Zoom group chat, if you have a question, uh, go ahead and write it um, on the Zoom group chat function or raise your hand in the participant section uh, function. Um, and I guess while people are thinking about their questions, um, I guess I'll start with one, um, thinking about the um, relationship between the knowledge transfer and the experience itself. Um, clearly, for the next couple months, perhaps even years, uh, this is going to be a completely different experience. Uh, and our learning is going to be, I mean, I, I don't think it can be just a transfer of knowledge. So what, what are some um, positive and negatives of, that you see of kind of migrating onto a screen and how can we make that knowledge transfer become a experiential um, uh, experience? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm an old professor and uh, what I learned uh, from my professional life is that uh, you teach not only transferring knowledge, uh, but you teach by contact. There is uh, a experiential component that you cannot abolish. On the other side, you need, in a certain sense, a basic knowledge before having an experience. I give you an example. You, you can enjoy the Sistine Chapel uh, online, but of course you experience that going Rome, paying, the, paying for, for a trip, and watching it having the sense of, I'm here. This is the experience, being there. But if you do not know anything about Sistine Chapel, and you go into the Sistine Chapel, you do not understand anything. It's not a real experience. The real experience need a sort of, a sort of component of knowledge. And is, then it boosts bolsters the knowledge. So the good of a situation like this, I do not know if I was able to transmit some knowledge. I hope so. But is the idea that you can transmit, you can transfer, you can share a number of knowledge or a quantity of knowledge which is ready then to support a true experience. So I hope you are going back as soon as possible to the experience. I hope I am able to go to Beijing as soon as possible, but nevertheless, you need to acquire knowledge before enjoying an experience. Yeah, and that, not that, by chance, not by chance, you have the two markets today, right. which are important markets uh, because we need uh, we need bread, and we need knowledge, and we need experience. Great. Uh, looks like we have a question from the audience, uh, Yang. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, how would you define reality? Yeah, thank you, Yang. It's, it's a very engaging question and I appreciate a lot uh, that. Reality is uh, in, in, if, of course, it's my, my answer could be 
let's take three hours or three days and I can answer. But uh, in short, in very short, uh, and using the concept I tried to share with you today, reality is at once uh, what I know to be reality and what I experience to be reality. So let's speak uh, about that. There is, um, I speak as, as, as my, to myself, uh, about myself as a researcher. I read a lot of books, it's my job, I'm paid for that. And I think I can take a lot of knowledge about things like uh, watching a movie. But nevertheless, if I'm a good researcher, I need to go and to see and to experience what is watching a movie. I need two things. I need knowledge and I need experience. And reality is at the crossroad of these two things. Reality is what we know is reality and is what we experience is reality. And I'm kidding, of course, uh, uh, but I can read uh, tons of books about love, but I do not know what love is in reality unless I live, I experience it. And we know that is true. Thank you. It's me to thank you, Yang. Any, any question is, is, is possible. So if you do not, I mean, I'm, 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 a re, I'm an old but a relaxed professor. And so I enjoy any question possible. Don't, don't be shy. We have another question here from Patrick. Hello. Thank um, you, Patrick. Oh, I, I got to turn on my, um, my camera. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, I tune in to your lecture because I'm, I'm interested in, uh, since you're a professor of uh, film and media studies, um, I'm interested in what will, um, after the pandemic, what will come out of this, um, this pandemic in, 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 a, um, move, in terms of movie output. Um, okay. Well, there will be a lot of, um, apart from documentaries, well, there will be a lot of um, stories on the screen to um, tell stories about the, uh, the kind of the global catastrophe that we, I, I guess none of us have experienced in our lifetime so far. Yes. Um, what do you think? Thank yeah, you. thank you, great question. I go back uh, to another pandemic, uh, which is interesting to have the idea that this, this is uh, the great pandemic of our times, but it's not the first pandemic uh, in, our, in human history. And in 18, as you know, 19 is, 20, is 1918, as you remember, has been this so-called Spanish flu. And the Spanish flu hit, hit very brutally uh, both Europe and America. And one of the things uh, uh, was immediately done uh, was to close the, to, to close up, to close down the, to, to shut down the film theaters. And uh, the owners of, uh, of, of the film theaters, uh, they reacted and they used the film theaters as a sort of a school for teaching people how to, how to resist or how to take care during the pandemic. They transformed this, the, the, the film theater, uh, they tried to transform the film theater in, in a sort of educational places. Uh, how we, I interpret that, that after a disaster like this, or like many other, like uh, September 11, etc., film provides, a, so what is called a remediation, provides a bunch of discourses to make something which is extraordinary, something to make it something which is understandable, I can stand with it, etc., etc., etc. 
What I'm expecting is a lot of movies transforming the question of pandemic into narrative in order to heal ourselves about our anxieties, to try to take care of the anxieties that the pandemic dropped on us. On the other side, uh, Patrick, sorry, it's a long answer. I think uh, that uh, if I think to Hollywood today, what is Hollywood? Is realistic stories, very biograph uh, movies about uh, real people and real situation, and escapist superheroes. We have, I think we are going to have a sort of radical split. More and more film is going to be an escapist uh, tool and is going to be something that helpful, is helpful to heal our anxieties in our real lives. I do not know, Patrick, if I answered that. Uh, I, I have, um, um, my, 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 another question is, um, <clears throat> apart from, um, I, I, yeah, your point, I, I got your point, it's very, um, it's convincing. Uh, my, another question is, apart from, uh, how will the, the movie, um, the people, the movie people treat this kind of uh, theme, the pandemic? Were they treated just as a background or how well they kind of treat the, 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 the pandemic directly? Oh, or um, let me phrase it in this way. Um, the pandemic to, to like to the Chinese now, the, the pandemic outside of China is kind of mostly a, a num about numbers, how many people have been affected, yeah. how many people have died. Um, it can, however, the, the movie can provide us with a kind of real people experiences that exactly. we won't, it won't be able to see um, in news. Like, um, so, I, so I'm expecting um, movies next year or in, or in the future to treat this theme very um, um, intensively. Um, do, you, do you think so? Yes, I, I completely agree. And especially, I want to underscore one passage of your comment, uh, which is very important. Now, the pandemic, uh, I mean, the general attitude is to transform the pandemic in knowledge, not in experience. We know about pandemic, how to take care of it, how many deaths, Toll we have all these kind of things, and we few of us they experienced the pandemic on in, on themselves, either because they got to the hospital or because the loss of a deer. Um, this is this is experience to have the sense of of, of death on your skin or in your deer. Film is exactly that because a visual, powerful visual language sometimes provides the experience that you do not have, the visually and the sensory experience that do you do not have in order to, to reach or to match the knowledge of things. Think about the experience uh, about, for example, uh, uh, Wall Street, uh, the, the movie was uh, The Wolf of, of Wall Street. We know that people in Wall Street are, we know they are not good. But he, the movie provides an experience of a brutal, how much brutal some of these guys are. Do you understand what I mean? So you're right. Film is going to provide the sense of experience after mass media transformed pandemic into knowledge and not longer in experience. Is the mass medium that provides a supplement of experience 
when, for example, press is providing a supplement of knowledge. This is the, the difference of the job of mass media. And um, so I'm expecting that, as you do, uh, I'm expecting people providing directly or indir indirectly the sense of, of the experience beyond the knowledge. I have a, a, a couple of questions, Devin, on, uh, on, uh, on chat. Can I answer? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you, Eugene, uh, ask me, Professor, what are the impacts of streaming service like Netflix on film industry and on society? Good or bad? Of course, thank you for the question. It's, it's super important question. Super important. I cannot, we cannot say good or bad. For some aspect is going to be good. For other is going to be bad. I make an example just to be clear and I take the responsibility of the example. We all, many people, including me, we hailed Twitter as a form of uh, easy communication and a way of uh, making possible the representation of the, the presence of all the opinion. And social networks, uh, not only Twitter, suddenly they transformed themselves uh, very often here in the United States in uh, uh, powerful means for resentment and hate. So the same instrument, the same thing is going for the good and for the bad. And I cannot say it's good and it's bad. It's both things. Um, Netflix, the good is for the investors. <laughs> People who have uh, sh shares of Netflix, Netflix are very happy now. I'm kidding, but it's true. There's an economical, uh, the economic aspect that's important. But for sure, Netflix uh, will help to share movies, to make uh, the spectator's body bigger. We are going to share Netflix is not, uh, uh, I, I, as, um, as well, dual, I'm a dual citizen, American and Italian, so I, I can look uh, with uh, different eyes. Uh, I, I, I complain the fact that uh, Netflix, uh, for example, uh, is not sharing movies beyond the United, beyond American movies. It's very rare to have a net in Netflix uh, uh, foreigner movies, European, Chinese, et cetera, movies. I guess one of the aspects is the library is going to be bigger because the volume of exchange are going to be bigger. For the bad uh, regime is that uh, Netflix uh, uh, obeys uh, an algorithm. They choose what apparently people choose and they make people choose what they choose because they think that people are choosing. So my choice is going to be not narrower, but more channeled. And I do not like that. Uh, Weijin, I, I hope I answered your question. And there's another question from uh, HC. Yes, exactly. This is, I, 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 I kept it because it's a fantastic, great question and, 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 uh, and very important. Um, yes, our experiences are constantly reshaped. And this is what is called uh, the process of civilization. 
The process of civilization is exactly to reshape our knowledge and our experience and the relation between experience and knowledge. The medieval European man had another kind of knowledge and in the same time another kind of uh, experience. Also basically what is told is, for example, the medieval European man had experience, he was able to capture reality like cats through, the, through his or her nose. Now we capture reality through our eyes. Our experience, the modern experience is ocular. And uh, in other culture, the experience is tactile. We reshape it. Modernity in Europe and in Western, I, I cannot say, I'm very anxious and very, I'm very, not anxious, I'm very, curious and, and, and eager to, for example, to have somebody here at Yale, I'm in conversation with uh, my Chinese friend and I'm going to ask them something about history of culture in China because I'm, I'm eager to understand that. But if I speak about European and Western culture, which is what I know, as has been since, uh, since the 16th century, has been a huge attempt to reshape our experience as an ocular experience and no longer another kind of uh, experience or experience through senses. Yes, so your question, uh, HCQI, is a great, great question. And what we are doing is that. And uh, what my question as a, as a scholar of media is what is, what media are doing. For example, uh, uh, my, my cell phone is transforming me from a purely visual man also in somebody who rediscovered the sense of touch. I have to acquire ability in touching that uh, were lost in a certain sense. But no, not all the touching is uh, is 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 coming back only only very only a small part of touching of our culture of touching and as uh, as a scholar of media i'm super interested in understanding what is the share of media in this transformation how they provide direction for the transformation and how globalization is dealing with that there is the moment, the gray moments of encounter of, uh, of uh, uh, I, 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 I beg your pardon, uh, really. And, uh, and I make uh, the example not, not for flattering anybody because you do not need a human need. But for example, uh, I, I love uh, one Chinese restaurant in New Heaven that uh, according my Chinese friend is, is real Chinese because most of the Western uh, uh, Chinese restaurants are half Chinese and half uh, American. And, and for example, the experience of, of smell, which is something that in many restaurants we are losing, not in, not in the kitchen of my grandma when I was a kid, was a delight for many. And the delight of looking, not only the taste. So I'm wondering if also the globalization is providing a reshaping of the experience. Uh, that's, we could go on forever about, <laughs> about the shaping of experiences. I mean, even with media and yeah, I, I found your cell phone example very fascinating, right? Because that, that's sort of what media is doing as well, right? Media provides, especially in America, it provides the news that you want to hear so that you become further channeled into your political view. Yeah. You know, and then... Algorithmic. <laughs> is the algorithmic, uh, algorithmic age. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we have uh, another question from Connie, uh, who raised her hand. Let's have Connie. 
Wait. Hi. Can Hi, Connie. Hello, because my internet is really bad, so I'm just checking if you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Um, no, no, I can first... hear you. Yay. Okay. So, um, first, I want to thank you for the amazing lecture. I really appreciate it. And um, so, speaking from real life experience, I realized that it's a lot harder for people to speak up or create intimate connections with people in virtual occasions. Like, like whereas it's quite more for people to look into each other's faces in real life. Somehow most people would prefer not to turn on their cameras if they have that option and they don't talk as much either. So, well, at least from what I've, exp uh, what I've observed. So what do you think are the reasons behind this phenomenon? And in what ways do you think future technology can be improved to strengthen our online experiences or like online relationships? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you, Connie. It's, it's a great Thank question. You. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, if, um, if I compare, uh, it's a very practical, I can compare what happens in class when mm -hmm. everybody is present and what happens when I, starting from March, I started to teach online. Mm. Um, if you experienced the relationship, you can use this device. If it's the, for the first time, it's much more difficult. Exactly mm -hmm. for the reason you mentioned. You still feel a distance. There is not this, uh, this contest of, there is no intimacy, real intimacy. And in class, you have the sense of intimacy. You close the door. You close, there is a seclusion. We are secluded and that creates a sense of intimacy. So, uh, despite uh, all uh, what uh, uh, Zoom is doing, uh, because uh, of course I can see you, I can read your chat, uh, I can do a lot of things, etc. We can share images, etc., etc. There is no sense of intimacy on Zoom unless we met before and we experienced each other live. Mm. In this sense, uh, I reiterate what I said in, during this lecture, during my lecture, I see this, uh, uh, this tool as a very propedeutic, as a very starting point for developing than experience of each other. Mm. This is a good moment for introduction, for starting, but there is uh, not, uh, uh, there is the, the lack of this intimacy or the lack of uh, this direct experience that make, uh, make a kittens uh, possible, et cetera. And uh, on the other side, Connie, I have to add, uh, that sometimes in class, some of the students are shy and online they are less shy. And that is the good of, of that. Mm. So uh, ideally, thinking about, uh, about what I'm, in, I'm doing next year, and next year so I'm, I'm going to teach, I hope for a couple of years more or more than a couple, I'm going not to see badly the idea of alternate this kind of instrument who make connection easier and live meeting that make experience possible. Mm, okay. Okay. Is Thank what you. is called my what my friend who are interested in what is teaching, etc called, uh, they call it uh, mixed teaching. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Mr. X here has 
two questions, one related to Connie's, but I think also he had another question beforehand. So I'm going to unmute him and Do you want to go ahead and just uh, share your question real quick? Yeah, um, I, uh, my internet might not be very well, so um, if it breaks or something, just uh, tell me. So my first question is to um, add on um, uh, the experience and uh, knowledge question. So I wonder, because like uh, in the past, before the pandemic, we typically go to the cinema to watch uh, films. And I think um, our direct uh, experience, including like the large screens and the dark surrounding, uh, pretty much um, contribute to like the uh, simulation film. Like yeah. it appears very real to us. Um, but now uh, during pandemic, yeah. unable to go to the cinema, do you think that will change somehow change relationship between the viewers and the film. Um, thank you for the question. I I've seen also another question on on chat, so I answered both of them. It's very good questions. Thank you for uh, about the experience of cinema. I do not know what's going to happen. I'm very curious, but I'm not able to. I think we all are eager to go back to the film theaters and to watch movies uh, outside home, not at home, etc. That's, that's for sure. But which kind of uh, is going to be, as we discussed more film on pandemics, etc. but I don't know. The second question you put on the chat is super interesting. Uh, it's true that Zoom is revealing uh, uh, intimates the intimate space of, of of the house of the home and that is 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 a good point i i had meeting with people on on bed i had it and i say it's quite a little bit embarrassing and but this this way sometime camera is is bear witness of what we are beyond what we think we are and that's uh, that's that's important anyway just to 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 make a joke uh, and uh, uh, I, I i hope all, you all and devin uh, especially is laughing this morning i wake up early and i read a text by an expert uh, how to frame yourself before a lecture, I, I I'm 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 teaching current currently on online, but I wanted to read that before this lecture, and uh, that that's interesting. He's a super. He's a social, sociologist. He's a super interesting. He made a say. I can tell you the most people they they prefer to frame themselves, Devin, like you, in front of the bookshelves. Is eighty percent of the frames in uh, in Zoom are in front of the book cell. So Connie, Devin, you are you are you are great. You are you are according my according this this sociologist. You are perfect. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting study. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I do find I do find. Um, some people better than others at, at understanding the the framing of Zoom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The other can, recommendation. Tell, the other I recommendation. You, I can tell that you studied it up. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Many, many professors will be like this or like this, <laughs> but you are exactly, you're a good. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, he recommends to keep the camera a little bit high, and second, if you do not have a if you do not have bookshelves. He proposed to, I mean, the second is in front of a poster. Great. But it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very funny, funny study. <laughs> we, it's, we like, have a lot. Uh, it's like, it's like people who are working on, 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 uh, on the selfies. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
<laughs> are you what is the man, the great the the the, 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 the maximum average of the self selfies is this way <laughs> there are a couple uh, other very interesting questions in the chat box um yeah uh let's see let's have yes i i see now okay so i respond i i answered ludanki ludanki thank you for i do not know if i pronounce uh, your name correctly can i uh, can can we see you or not okay thank you hello okay thank you lou i i you you want to propose the question or uh, do you want me to go directly to an, to the answer? Um, uh, actually, I just want to uh, know that um, as recently, um, our Chinese people may uh, concentrate more on on those uh, lit not only literature works but also some uh, films on the on the same topic that is pan pandemic or plague. Um, and I just, I am just curious that whether there is such an upsurge in America, and what yeah. do you think about the fictional narratives and real stuff, uh, real stories? What the relationship is between those two? Yeah. Thank you, Lou. Uh, I do not have a clear figures. I'm sorry. What I can tell you is that there is a huge number on, if you go online, especially the online journals of uh, the, the media and film uh, online journals, they have uh, a, a lot of, uh, they have long list of movies that uh, you, uh, about pandemic uh, that you are suggested to watch. Uh, for example, uh, I've seen quite recently um, 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 a film web website which is called the Vulture, like, like the, the bird, and it listed the 64 movies uh, that uh, you are recommended to watch during the pandemic, it's about uh, not only about uh, pandemic, but it's uh, about uh, all the kind of anxieties that pandemic uh, uh, rises. Why that? Uh, I I repeat uh, something that I told previously because film uh, do two things quite often. It provides uh, experience that you can add to the knowledge and it provide healing it's a way of feel uh, spectators uh, from or take or, or or try to take care of spectators for 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 their anxieties film has been a, i'm joking has been the great uh, psychoanalyst uh, of the 20th century Great. Uh, and speaking of film being our therapist, <laughs> um, Sally, uh, one of our staff, uh, actually has a question about. Um, okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> Sally. Hi, Sally. <laughs> and thank you for taking Hi. care of us. Hi. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, my question actually, uh, I, I find that, uh, you know, this pandemic really, actually you already talked about, you know, uh, people's behavior changed uh, and they maybe wonder whether this is a point that is a revolution for the whole uh, industry, uh, media industry. Uh, like, you know, many people actually, you know, for traditional movie, uh, you know, makers and goers, they are living really, really tough time. And um, how do you think, to, uh, you know, uh, how, how they should respond this change and whether this is a total new revolution for the whole movie, uh, you know, industry? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sally. 
I, I'm expecting many changes, but in the meantime, I'm expecting also to go back to the tradition. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, we are, I, I think we are restoring a lot of old habits. That in this moment, for example, in Europe, uh, uh, what my friends, uh, especially my French friends, uh, are sending me or calling me or, or texting me is, I want to go back and sit in a coffee house. And that is really the great experience I'm lacking, I missed. Uh, so you are going to, I think you are going to restore uh, what I call the strategies of repair. You are re taking back, but also you are going to have a lot of ad what I call the adaptation uh, uh, from the co-evolutive uh, theory. Uh, um, I, I took this, this, this term, adaptation. We are adapting ourselves to the new situations. So I'm going, I'm going to think that uh, we are going, on, on one side, uh, we, are, we are going back to the tradition and the other side, we are pushing forward uh, toward the future. One of the things I, I'm, I feel is that my own university, Yale, is going to increase the use of this instrument, these tools for teaching not as a substitute of teaching, as an addition to teaching. We are going to use more and more. As professor, we are not, we are not uh, any longer expecting only to go in class, to go in class, but also to use this kind of instrument more and more. I think it's going to be the both sides and uh, how they, they mix, and they match, I don't know, but it's, I'm eager to understand how it does, how it's, it's going to be. Great. And that's actually somewhat related to uh, HCQJ's follow-up question. Uh, yeah. Would you, HCQJ, do you want to uh, share your question? Maybe they're a little shy, uh, but I think it was a follow up on the previous discussion of talking about yeah. the process, the process I, of being natural or positive. Exactly. This thing, again, again, AG, AGCQI, your questions are fantastic uh, and uh, really and, and very provocative, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, uh thank you do you think this process of civilization is natural positive is it possible that we are entering the situation of hyper normalization in which we are we might be facing chaos or devaluation of knowledge uh and and uh, uh, HCQI apologize for not being able because the device doesn't work. But uh, uh, the, your question is is great. Uh, I, the process of civilization is neither natural nor nor not natural. Is is both. The process of civilization is exactly a sort of struggle and and uh, and uh, and compromise between what we call nature and we call, we, we call culture is, is a conflict and, and, a, and, and mutual arrangement of cultural and, 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 uh, and natural things. I was raised as, as a semiologist and exactly what I was learned uh, uh, from the beginning is that how we speak in our life, everything is becoming natural and, and that nothing is natural at all. I, I was, I was uh, one of the young boys around Umberto Eco and, and the French uh, great uh, 
great uh, masters and that that was very clear so the process of civilization is is that and is based uh, this is for another lecture devin but is based on two basic things there is an appropriation of the means from outside and an interiorization of this appropriate of these means and there is a way in which we bring our abilities outside us and we build ma machines that perform instead of us this is civilization exteriorization and interiorization that is what happens uh, your question is also if we are going to a process of hyper normalization i do not know if we are we can think that there is in this world and normalization i do not know i i do not think it's is possible it's of course once again there is a compromise there is a compromise between individuality and collective body there is a compromise between uh, human uh, desires and and uh, social needs there is a compromise about that how much the pandemic is arranging that i do not know i do not know but i i understand that our 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 encounters and the use of media is going to change a little bit that that's clear to me and it seems media is going to change us <laughs> yes as well. they are going to change us but they are going to change too I, one one thing is for sure the the sense of reality in the media is no longer it has, it has to change after you experienced after a great experience your your it, knowledge is, is is not enough you need more experience and and vice versa all right well time is the last about question is uh, right. uh, recommended a documentary or or a film yep oh so you are a film study anything active. because it takes three hours <laughs> you can write to me i put my address you can write to me if you need uh, more questions uh, it takes time but i can do that uh, and i also authorized devin to share the powerpoint if you need and if you want it uh, we can uh, we can send it to you great so if anybody has further questions uh, professor has graciously agreed uh, to uh, take your emails so you don't know the exact spelling feel free to go back to the advertisement uh, on WeChat and that'll you, you'll see the spelling of his name uh, and of course if you want the PowerPoint he's also graciously agreed to share that as well so um, feel free to ask one of our co-workers uh, on the WeChat platform and we will have be happy to share that with you um, so thank you once again everybody for joining us um, thank you professor for a fantastic conversation um, and I, I must say that even though it's through the screen, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Devin. Thank you a lot. And thank you also the, the technical staff uh, that make that possible. I, I'm very grateful. And so uh, per, per Chinese tradition, um, modern Chinese tradition, we like to take group pictures at the end of events. Um, okay. So if people are willing to again if people are willing to uh show their camera please show your camera so we can take a group photo uh together uh and smile and then i will also unmute everybody so that everybody can uh thank professor um personally so i'm going to unmute everybody here we go thank, thank you, you professor, thank you, professor. <laughs>